She and my aunt were members of the American Association of University Women, and they did that. They got a chance to know each other back in the 70s. She and my aunt uh, ended up in the same um, independent living environment. I would just see her almost daily because we'd have dinner together. So then she became family. We looked at each other as family, and she treated me like a daughter. She was very proud of of her parents, and especially her father, both of them. Uh, so she spoke very highly of them. Her mother uh, was an artist and a, and a classical pianist, and so uh, she gave me her mother's uh, piano books. Her mother's paintings were wonderful. Landscapes and stuff, so I said, well, who did this? My mother, who did that? Well, my mother did that. Another thing was she said she was um, so independent and her father taught her to be independent. So her lamp was broken. And I said, well, I'll get you a new one. And it was almost like I said a bad word to her to say, I'll get a new one. She said, you will not. You're gonna go to the hardware store and you're gonna get this and we're gonna fix this lamp because my father taught me how to fix a lamp and I'm gonna teach you how to fix one. And so you know, we did. By seventh grade, I decided I wanted to be an astronomer. And I certainly did not receive any encouragement. I didn't think I could get tenure as a research astronomer because I looked around and the, I think there was one other woman in astronomy who had tenure in this country. I started in NASA in 1959. I was six months old. When I joined the government, I was hired as a fresh PhD in spite of the fact that I had not only six years of experience, but an international reputation. My salary at the, at the university was so low that they did not reckon, that civil service did not recognize that as a professional experience. She really, because of the challenges she went through with her career, as a woman, she wanted to make sure that women who were interested in the sciences, interested in astronomy and whatnot, would be able to go through it and not have the barriers that she had to face. So it was very important for her to set up special scholarships or fellowships for women who wanted to pursue those avenues. This is one, and I really love this quote from her. And it says, I was told by many people that a woman could not be an astronomer. I'm glad I ignored them. Well, I think I've always been curious, but um, astronomy in particular was a subject I wanted to learn more about. Between fifth and sixth grade, I organized my friends into an astronomy club to study the constellations. And by seventh grade, I decided I wanted to be an astronomer and that I was going to try for it. I knew it was going to take me another 12 years of schooling, but I figured I'd try. She and my aunt uh, ended up in the same um, independent living environment. And she had a telescope in her apartment too. She stayed on a high floor. So then, you know, on a clear night, you could look in. So it was just totally fascinating. My main astronomical research area when I started out was what they call spectral classification, looking at stars, spreading the light out into a rainbow so that you could see the different colors separately. What I started out doing was looking at these spectra, looking at these rainbows, and deciding the temperature and the brightness of the stars. And, and then I was trying to find out how far away they were and how they moved. I just wanted to satisfy my curiosity and I'm curious. So one thing that Nancy said uh, is she said, when NASA was formed, one of the men there asked me if I knew anyone who would like to set up a program in space astronomy. He didn't ask her, he asked her if she knew anyone. And so she applied. So she says, and I decided that the idea of influencing astronomy for 50 years was just more than I could resist. And so I took the job. The idea of Hubble was something that was among the astronomical community for generations. So what I did was to bring together a 
collection of astronomers from all over the country trying to represent a variety of things that we might do with the telescope and some NASA engineers and get them to sit down together and come up with something that the engineers thought would work and that the astronomers thought would do their job. When Nancy graduated her PhD, there was no such thing as a NASA administrator for astrophysics. It was a job uh, that she created basically uh, when she was first hired. People generally aren't terribly interested in what gets things started. And so I'm not sure they're going to have much of an idea of my role. It's hard to, to, to decide how history will view my accomplishments. If I brought anything to the Hubble project, it was perseverance and belief that it was possible. How humble is that? She wasn't a very showy, flashy person, or I'm Dr. Roman, that just wasn't her. She testified for NASA, she got an entire astronomical community at a time when all astronomers didn't really get along. To go behind this mission, form the committee, she invented the type of NASA peer review. She was the peer review for a really long time, and then she started outsourcing it. She did all of this to bring Hubble around. It was greenlit for funding about 1978, about a year before she retired. It's more than just perseverance and belief. It's being incredibly effective and personable and going all across the country to convince astronomers to do this mission. She, I think she would probably say, well, could they have come up with another name? Because she was just so humble. Uh, but I think she would just be so elated, honored. Uh, but I, I think she would just, she. Oh gosh, beyond the stars and the moon.